Hi guys, welcome to another GIMP tutorial. This GIMP tutorial is going to be a little bit different. And in fact, all of the GIMP tutorials from now on are going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're currently embarking upon what will probably be the last eight GIMP tutorials I do. Um, basically, I've been making GIMP tutorials for a very long time. You'll notice that my uh, output's dropped off quite significantly over the last couple of years. Frankly, I've just gotten bored with it. Um, but there was one last thing I wanted to do, and uh, I want to do it well, so I'm going to put all of the videos together first and then release them in one hit, so you won't have to wait for everything. After that, who knows what's going to happen with this channel. I don't think I'll close the channel down, but um, it's very unlikely that I'll be making GIMP tutorials in the future after this series is finished. So if you decided that you were only really ever a subscriber because you wanted the GIMP tutorials, I wouldn't hold it against you if you wanted to... Uh, unsubscribe. There will be no hard feelings, it is your prerogative. But on with the series. So this series is going to be about using Python Foo uh, to script uh, our own plugins and our own programs to automate some of the work we do in GIMP. And this is something I've been trying to do for a very long time and it took me a long time to learn how to do it. Um, I've followed a lot of tutorials and I found them very hard to follow. Um, but gradually I got there. So what I'm trying to do with this series is to try and make that level of scripting in the GIMP possible for even a beginner. And I mean an absolute beginner. So this tutorial is designed to help people that have absolutely no experience with programming at all in any language. The basic principles you need to understand before you can use Python Foo and start scripting in GIMP are actually quite easy. So it won't be that long before you can understand everything you are doing in simple scripts um, that we'll explore in this series. Hopefully by the end of the series you should be able to write your own script, uh, script from scratch that can automate a series of tasks to produce a desired effect. If you were particularly savvy, you would be able to basically replicate pretty much any of the GIMP tutorials I have made in the past and turn those into scripts. And in fact we're going to look at in some of the later videos in this series, some of those techniques I've used years ago in old videos and turn them into scripts so they just happen automatically. But before we can get into writing those scripts, we have to learn some basic Python. If you know the basics of Python already, now Python's a programming language for those of you that don't know, um, if you know the basics of Python, you can skip this, so you can skip this video. Um, I'm going to be covering the absolute basics. So if you know anything about Python, you probably know what I'm about to go over with you. Uh, today we're going to be looking at um, variables, simple mathematical expressions and functions. Some of the vocabulary might be unfamiliar, but it's pretty easy to pick up. And you might be wondering why we're going to be looking at some maths for the GIMP, but it will make sense in later tutorials. It's to do with figuring out brush sizes or figuring out image sizes and finding the middle of an image. All of those things rely on some basic understanding of maths. So we're going to have to have a look at some really simple stuff, but I promise you it's nothing more difficult than um, adding and taking away. Now I should point out, I've had Python and GIMP separately installed on my computers for years, so I can't remember if you need to download Python separately or not. Um, and I can't really do a clean install of either the GIMP or Python without really messing up my computer. So the first thing you're going to need to do is open up GIMP, go to Filters, go down to Python Foo, and click on Console. Now hopefully both of those will be there for you. If this window pops up, the Console, um, which we also sometimes call the Shell, then we're good to go. However, if any of those steps didn't work, what you're probably going to need to do is Download GIMP, uh, sorry, download Python yourself. Python 2.7 will be the one um, that the GIMP uses, so that would be the one you'd need to download. And I'll put a link to that in the um, in the information for this video. I should also point out that programming isn't an easy thing to learn from a video, um, although all of you watching this have gotten to know my videos through the videos. So what will what I'll also make available is all of the material that gets put in the videos will also be replicated in blog posts, which should be easier to follow. And I'll also make all of the code available that I write available through um, 
guests or jests, depending on how you want to pronounce that, which is the GitHub way of sharing um, basically code snippets. If you don't know what any of that means, it doesn't matter, you'll figure it out. So anyway, today we're going to be looking at variables. A variable is a label we can give to a value. Um, it might not always be the same every time we run it, um, but to give you an example, I might have a script that puts some copyright information on my photos. Now I could hard code my name and the year of creation into a script so that every time you click the button, um, it puts a little watermark on the image that says Jackson Bates 2015. Uh, but what about next year? You know, Should I manually change that script every year um, so that the year keeps up with it? Or what if I publish the script for others to use um, and then they need the name to be something that can be changed? So the sensible thing for us to do is store the name and the year as separate variables. Now to create a variable in the console window, it's very simple. We just type in the name of the variable. So in this case, I'm going to call it name equals and then in speech marks we write whatever we want that to be okay so in my case I'm going to put my name when I press enter you see nothing happens uh, and then to set the year I can do the same thing year equals 2015 in speech marks and enter now what I've just done is told GIMP what my variables contain what values they contain if I want to see those variables, um, I can simply type in some commands like print name and it says Jackson Bates or I can say print year and we get 2015. One of the cool things we can do with variables like this is add them together using the plus operand uh, or the plus sign. So for example, I can say print name plus year and you can see that what that does is it prints the name of the the name and the year but it jams them together because we didn't add a space in between what we could do is say print name plus uh, speech mark space speech mark so this is a printed space and I'll refer to this in the future as a printed space uh, plus year and there we can see Jackson Bates 2015 what we can also do is create a new variable from the two old ones. So let's just say I wanted to create one called copyright info and I'm using an underscore here to represent a space to make my variable nice and readable. Uh, copyright info equals name plus a printed space plus year. Now again that doesn't print anything to the screen but if I was to now say print copyright info and it helps if you spell everything correctly it now prints that same thing so this should be pretty straightforward now notice that each of my variables has a very easy to understand name this is a good habit to get into you should be able to tell exactly what a variable represents Python is actually a pretty readable language and you can make that easier for yourself if you add variables that are easily readable too so notice that I also use that underscore for a space. Um, a variable name can be split up by this kind of underscore as a space just to make it a bit more easily readable. So what happens if we change the year and then print copyright info again? So remember we set the year as 2015. We said name and year equals copyright info or the other way around rather. If I now change the value of year, what effect would you expect that to have? So let's just say year equals 2016. So I can test this and see that it still says Jackson Bates 2015. You can see the copyright info variable didn't change. Python doesn't remember that copyright info was initially built from name and year and then assume that when we update one that should flow on. If you want the variable copyright info to update, you need to assign the values again. So if I was to go back, uh, I've just pressed up a few times to repeat a previous statement. That's how it came up so quickly. Um, if I set that again, copyright info now equals name plus printed space plus the new value of year. 
and then print copyright info again, now we can see that it's been updated the way we would expect. So that's something we need to remember. When we change a variable that had an effect on something else, if we want that effect to carry over, we need to reestablish that second, uh, we need to reassign that second variable again. So the thing to remember about variables is that they are, it's good for them to have an easy to remember name that represents a value that can change. Um, so the fact that it can change means it can vary, that's why it's called a variable. The second thing we've learned is that we can perform operations on variables. We can stitch variables together when we print them, or we can stitch them together to make a new variable. The proper word for this is concatenation, which is just a fancy word for sticking them together like we did when we made copyright info out of um, by concatenating the name, the printed space, and the year. So what do you think would happen if we wrote something like this? Print copyright underscore info minus year. So just take a moment to think through what logical thing you'd expect to see. Well, what we get here is an error message. Now don't be scared of these, you'll see plenty of them. And it's not because you suck, it's because that's just what happens when you write programs. What it tells us here is that we can't use a minus sign for a string. Okay, so in all of this nonsense, it tells us type error is an unsupported operand type for minus, string, and string. So all that's telling us is you can't use a minus sign on strings. So what is a string? Uh, I should say it's not even saying string, it's saying str. But a string stand, uh, str stands for string. There are three main types of variable that we'll focus on in this tutorial. There are more types of variable, but for our purposes, we're just going to get by with these three to begin with. So the three we're going to look at are strings, integers, and floats. A string, the str that we saw earlier, is a string of literal text. Anything you put in quotes is a literal string in Python. If you add a piece of text to another piece of text, you concatenate them. You stick them together. But Python doesn't know how to do any other math. Well, not any other, but it doesn't know how to do all mathematical um, looking expressions to strings, as we saw with minus. You can't divide a string by another string. You can multiply a string by an integer. Okay, so an integer is a whole number. You can multiply a string by an integer. So, for example, what effect do you think this would have? Print hello times five. So what might that do? Well, as we can see here, it prints hello five times and it concatenates them all. So it can understand some things, but not every mathematical um, thing can be used. Now, what you might notice is when I typed in the five there, that wasn't in quotation marks. When we wrote the year as 2015 earlier, we were treating it as a text string. We weren't going to do any maths on it. We were treating it as a label. When we used the 5, um, we were using it as an integer. We wanted to use it for maths. Um, and that means we can use it for any maths. And in fact, all integers start to behave exactly the way we'd expect. In fact, not exactly the way we'd expect, but they, they can be used for pretty simple maths. So, for example, if I was to say print 1 plus 2 plus 3 then it returns the value 6, adds those numbers up for us. That's different to if I was to say print 1 plus 2 plus 3. So take a moment to think, what do you think this will do when I press enter? If 1, 2, 3, press enter, returns 6, what about the literal string 1 plus the literal string 2 plus the literal string of 3? Well, hopefully you've got the right answer. It concatenates 1, 2, and 3. It treats them as text strings and it sticks them together. Now, an integer is a whole number, and we need to remember that because if we try to divide an integer by another integer, it will return an integer. That's okay when the number is perfectly when the first number is perfectly divisible by the second number, but if you expect it to return a fraction or a decimal, you'll be disappointed since they are not whole numbers. So, for example, if we were to say print ten 
divided by 5, we get 2, which is what we would expect, and that's easy to understand. But what if we were to say print 3 divided by 2? Now, you and I know that 3 divided by 2 is 1.5, but it's going to tell us that it's 1. Now, what we can do is we can use the modulus operand, the percent sign, to see what's going on. So if we say print 3 percent sign 2, or modulo 2, and then press enter again, this tells us that there is a remainder of 1. So those two pieces of information together tell us that if you divide 3 by 2, there is 1 in each group and 1 left over. Pretty simple maths, but it's worth remembering. All we really need to know about integers is that they are whole numbers and return whole numbers when used in calculations. The final type we will look at is the floating point number, or simply a float, which is a decimal number. To set a variable as a float, we must use a decimal point, even if it's a whole number originally, like this. So I might say number 1 equals 3.0, and I might say number 2 equals uh, 2.0. And now if I say print number 1 divided by number 2, so print the floating point 3 and the floating point 2, divide those by each other, and what we get is 1.5. So that's the result we were probably expecting when we divided 3 by 2 before. If we forget what type of variable we've set, we can use a built-in function like this. We can say type number 1, and it will tell us the type is a float. Um, now you can try that on some of the other variables we've already set. So it's worth remembering when you follow these tutorials along, particularly these early ones, it can be quite difficult to understand to begin with. So don't be afraid to pause the video, try things out, um, try breaking some of the code I've given you, and see what kind of behaviours it exhibits, because that's really how you'll start to learn this stuff. Anyway, I appreciate this has probably been a pretty dry video to begin with, but it does get a lot more interesting when we start making the really fun stuff. So thanks for watching, and in the next video we'll be looking at making functions.